This webinar features information from Todd Stanley's book, When Smart Kids Underachieve in School. This book is available from Proofrock Press at proofrock.com, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your favorite bookseller. Our guest today is Todd Stanley. He has written 14 books for Proofrock Press. And let me take you real quickly over to the Proofrock Press website. If you come in and in the search box, just type Todd Stanley's name, you'll see all of the books that Todd has written. Uh, a lot of product on uh, uh, project-based learning, a lot of, 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 of uh, products on, on uh, performance-based assessment, authentic assessment. Uh, Todd has a vast amount of experience in gifted education, and it shows through the, the, the books that he's written for us. He is a national board certified teacher, and he is also the gifted services coordinator for Pickerington Local School District in Ohio. Uh, Todd, welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you those who are, who are tuning in. I appreciate you, guys, you giving us your time. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so let's kind of operationalize what we mean by underachieving gifted students. Uh, in, in the book, you, you define that as the difference between uh, a, a child's potential and their actual performance. And uh, so, but, but one of the things you kind of bring up is this idea that gifted kids often, essentially, we, they underachieve and we don't even know it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so I'm going to put up this uh, on my screen just real quick so I can show these, this definition so that people can see that. So um, all right. So here's kind of the, the uh, definition of underachievement is that it's, it's the discrepancy between potential and actual achievement. So we often hear underachievement and we think of kids that are failing or kids who are not doing really well at school at all. Um, and, but that's not what underachievement is, it's, it's this discrepancy. So if the kid has the potential to be a really strong math student but is only getting a C in his math class because for whatever reason, he, he may be underachieving in that class. Um, there's also the discrepancy between predicted achievement. So if a kid is, uh, is identified as gifted in ELA, then you would expect that that kid every year or you know, as years go by would continue to do well in that class, but that's not always the case either. Um, and, it, and basically it's the, under, the uh, underachievement is the failure to develop your potential. And because gifted kids have such a high potential, um, because they have this ability um, that gives them this potential, you can be underachieving in your, and a gifted kid could be getting all A's and still underachieving. Uh, I had a kid. I had a kid in particular named Mitch who would get straight A's for me all the time. But I knew he wasn't doing. He wasn't working up his potential. You could tell. Um, and but he he but he was smart enough to play the game of school enough that he could get his A's. And then he would he would give minimal effort otherwise. Uh, that that makes sense. Uh, let me let me grab the screen back. Yeah, there we go. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, so uh, you, you tell a story about a kid at the beginning of your book who was clearly uh, gifted and, and, and not really performing very well in some of his classes. And I think you formed a personal relationship with him and, and were instrumental in sort of his perfor performance and, and eventually went to Harvard. Uh, can, can you tell a little bit about that story and then tell us a little bit about what happened? Sure. So the student was Mike, uh, and Mike to this day remains one of my favorite students. You know, we're not supposed to play favorites, but we do. Um, and so when Mike came to me, he, he was wearing a, a kiss hat from the, the group Kiss. It was like a toboggan or like a, 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 a winter cap that said, I was like, oh, this kid's going to be something. He's a seventh grader. Um, and you could tell, and this is the thing about most kids, uh, you can tell within five minutes that they're extremely bright. And so you could tell from a five minute conversation with Mike that he, he was really sharp. And he was constantly asking questions of me um, and constantly challenging me. But I was a fairly new teacher. I think it was my third or fourth year I was teaching. And so I didn't know anything different. And I was like, oh, he's asking really good questions. Um, and then I went into a staff meeting and the English language arts teacher who had been teaching for like 25 years is like, well, Mike is always trying to make me look dumb. And he's, oh, and I'm like, well, what is he doing? And she's like, well, he's asking questions. And I'm like, you know, that, that's, that's Mike. And so 
I, I, like you said, I, I looped him for, so I had him for seventh and eighth grade. So we had spent two years together and formed a really strong relationship. Um, and, and during that time, I, I started to take my, or Mike's ability and use it for the, the purposes of good rather than evil. So rather than <laughs> messing with his English language arts teacher, um, he, he was using it to, to do his, the work that was, um, you know, that was important to him. And then I, I also had the fortune of, um, I taught on a program um, that was for kids from all over the county. And it was, uh, and he, so I had him as an 11th and a 12th grader as well. So I had Mike for four years in class. And it, it was amazing. Um, to, I mean, the nice thing about looping kids, if you've ever had the chance to do that as a teacher, is you really get to see a lot of growth. Um, and for four years, I saw you know, Mike grow exponentially. Um, and then he eventually, he applied to Harvard um, and like I wrote him a letter of recommendation and he got in and I, I was just like so amazed. And, um, but even there he had trouble. Um, he, I remember he called me on a Thanksgiving the very first year um, and he was saying he was having trouble fitting in and in, in the Harvard, you know, the, um, the culture there. And I, and I tried to encourage him to stick with it. Um, and just a, just a brilliant kid, just, just a, you know, a really nice kid. Um, and, but he definitely, I, I fear like there are other mics out there who don't have that relationship with a teacher or with someone who, and so they'll underachieve. And so they, they will not be the, the person that, that Mike eventually became. So. Yeah. You know, I think that came out as one of the more human parts of your book is this idea that, a caring teacher is sort of pivotal to, for some of these kids. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. much so. And, and I talk about that in the book also is that uh, there were famous underachievers, uh, like, you know, the, the, the common one that's always used is Albert Einstein, you know, did really horribly when he was in grade school. Um, but he also eventually came across his mentor, Max Talmy, who was a science, a college student who was taking all these science classes, and he gave uh, Einstein all his books and he would come for dinner every week and he would talk with them and and uh, Einstein formed a friendship with this guy and, and without Max Taumey there there would be no Albert Einstein as we know him um, I, I'm convinced of that um, in most of those cases um, they the people who are underachievers the reason why they're able to turn it around is because someone showed that they cared um, and I call this the caring factor uh, in the book and, and this is a no-brainer everyone knows if you show that you care um, kids will respond. Uh, but I, I was struck by this because I was at a um, National Association for Gifted Children conference, and this one speaker was, she had worked with ninth grade underachievers. These kids were flunking their classes, but they were gifted, and she was working with them, and they turned it around in no time. And when she interviewed them afterwards, every single kid to a T just said, well, it was nice to know that someone cared, or I, I just never realized that someone still cared about my grades. And it was, that, it was that caring factor that played a huge difference with them, that this teacher actually, you know, recognized that they, they had potential and she cared about that. And they, they responded in, akin because of that. Uh, that's, that's, that's a great, that's a great story. Uh, so I got a, I got a story. I, I, I had a kid, well, we were, I, I was a, you know, teacher uh, when I started out after college and, and uh, did that for four years and loved it and, lo and, and it had the privilege of teaching gifted classes. And, and we were trying to identify some kids from, my, I was a high school teacher, so junior level English. And we, so we used one of the behavior observation scales uh, as part of our identification process. And we got this kid that had uh, 135 IQ, his, he was 99th percentile on all of his achievement measures and his, his behavior scale came back and it was like, you know, it's like one to five. How 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 did, how much does this kid exhibit this behavior? And it was like all ones. And mm -hmm. at the bottom, uh, the teacher said, "This is the laziest kid I've taught twenty years." <laughs> so th th that comes up in your book, though, is this concept of that some the perception that a kid is lazy and 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 I'd like to ask you about that, but I also want you to weave in a little bit about what you talk about of the game of school and how some kids just don't want to play that game and and maybe talk a little bit about our attitudes about laziness and and what that yeah well what it comes down to is what's called goal valuation, and this is a personal stamp that you individually put on something, whether it's worthy or not um, and there are there are three things that affect that one is do you think it's important? So if you think something is important, you will place value on it and you will pay attention and you won't be lazy about it. If you think that um, something is uh, uh, um, interesting, which is a big one, 
then you will pay attention. And then uh, the last one of the goal, goal evaluation is that you think that it's attainable. So uh, some kids only need one of those uh, in order to be motivated. And they'll, they'll be like, oh, that's interesting. I'll pay attention. Or another kid will be like, oh, I think I can get an A on that. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Um, there are other kids that need two of those. There's some kids that need all three of them. So imagine the kid, it has to be, um, he has to be told that it's important or convinced that it's important, not told, but convinced that it's important. He has to, uh, it has to be interesting to him, something that he latches onto, and he has to think, I can do this. And if any one of those um, is not present, he's gonna shut down. And people attribute that to laziness, but it, it's not, it's, it, it's this, we've, school itself has kind of shaped some of these students in that uh, they showed um, the school cliff, uh, Gallup poll did a, did a poll and they showed the school cliff where kids, lose interest over as long as they're in school. So when they're in elementary school, they're extremely interested um, and motivated as a result. Interest and motivation are highly, you know, highly connected to one another. Um, and then by the time they get to middle school, that drops. By the time they get into high school, less than half kids and half of the kids are interested anymore. And so their motivation goes down. And this happens because if you, you know, we put kids in chairs and we talk at them. Um, and so that's not very interesting way to learn. I, I always, it always pains me when I do things like this or I do lectures because that's not how I teach. Um, my, the way I teach is I'm very hands-on. I mean, I'm, I'm very hands-off when it comes to being in front of the classroom, but hands-on having conversations with kids and moving around the room and working those relationships. And, that, that's, and that's the way I think that kids respond. Again, is that if you have, if you have a conversation with them, they're gonna respond. Um, but if you are talking to the class as a whole, they can kind of hide in the back or in the corner and kind of be that, that, that kid that we call lazy, um, but it's, it's that we're not engaging them. And, and I think teachers are getting it. The more, the more I'm in education, the more it seems like teachers are getting this. It used to be like, kids have to do it my way. Uh, there's only one way to do it and it's my way and they have to you know, perform to my way or they can, they, they're gonna get bad grades. Teachers are realizing you have to personalize the learning now, and like each kid is different. Then that what that's what makes it really tough about underachievement is that um, different kids will have different things that cause them to underachieve or different subject areas. I was a huge underachiever in math. Uh, I am not not a math fan at all. It doesn't interest me at all. And um, but my senior year, I had this teacher, Mr. Goodrich. I still remember his name. Um, he made it interesting. For the first time, math was really interesting. It was a trigonometry class. And I was like, wow, math can be interesting. And that, and I got an A in this class. Before I, I got a D plus in my, in my algebra two class. I know people are like, I'm losing all credibility, but I got a D plus in my <laughs> algebra two class. And then I, I got a D in my geometry class, but they just weren't very interesting to me. Um, and so I was that, I mean, this, this is why this book is near and dear to my heart is I was an underachieving kid. I, I was, if you look at my GPA in high school, it is embarrassing. My, I show it to my kids and I'm just like appalled at what it was uh, because I, I just did what I had to do to get, to get enough to get, to get by in class. So I never did homework. I never studied for tests. Um, I was a smart enough guy. I, w I don't know if you would call me gifted. I was never tested for that, but I was a smart enough guy that I could figure out how to get a, a C on something and I would pass yeah. the class. So. Yeah, and I and I, I was going to ask you in a sec about the causes for mm -hmm. that for that, and then also some of your suggested solutions. But but I I thought you had this great line in the book that relates to what you were just talking about. So I mean, part of this the thing is all all of us as educators, you know, we have this awareness that this game of school does prepare you for a great deal after you know it's it, success in college and then potentially success in the workforce and 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 all of these benefits that you get. By, by getting good at this and but there are these kids that don't want to play that game you know and and you I in your in the book you you ask this sort of question of well, how can we get someone to win the game when they're not willing to play by the rules and yeah. it, it, and then a lot of what your solutions uh, in this book sort of focus on those kind of those how do we do that uh, can you talk a little bit about the the causes for underachievement and then some of the solutions that you've sure I'm just going to go back for a second, though, and what you said is yeah. part of that game also is that we try to motivate kids with grades. Um, and the, the problem is some kids don't care about grades, but teachers don't change. They're like, I'll just give them an F. It's like that doesn't motivate them. Give them an F. It's not really going to change the behavior. And so I, I think, again, we're getting better as educators at recognizing that kids need 
different motivation. Uh, and so the grade is not necessarily the motivation. There are some kids, like my, my younger daughter, she's a teacher pleaser. She wants to get a good grade. That's what she cares about. And that's going to motivate her. Uh, there are other kids uh, who really don't care about the grade. And yet we were like, well, we'll, give them a, we'll show them. We'll give them a zero. And it's like, kids like, I don't care. I never cared in the first place. Um, yeah, well, and that, you know, but that, then that inform a lot of your work. I mean, like yeah. in, the, in terms of your writing, the, yeah. from the, the performance-based projects, the mm -hmm. project-based learning that you've done, everything that you've done is the idea of, of sort of changing that, the classroom vision that you've got that mm -hmm. in, 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 in motivating kids with a different kind of way of teaching. Correct, correct. So let me show you the causes. Um, first, I want to talk about the, the symptoms of uh, underachievement. So these are things that you might see in your classroom that, um, that, that are signs of underachievement. So these are kids that take easier classes uh, or, take, or choose an easy way out. So if you have um, scaffolded something or you have differentiated something and you give them a chance to challenge themselves and they take the less challenging piece, that may be because they, they're an underachiever. Um, they, they will avoid competitive academic activities um, because they don't want to fail. Gifted kids, so, so and different, every gifted kid is different. But what happens to a lot of gifted kids is things come easy to them in elementary school. Uh, they were reading early. They could do their, their numbers early. So an elementary school is a breeze to them. And they get into middle school, and it's still pretty easy. They didn't get by on, with their, on their smarts. Eventually what happens to everyone is it catches up with you and you can't do something just using your brains alone. Um, to me, it happened in college. And so I got into college and my first year I was an academic probation, again, losing all credibility. But, but, um, but and the reason why is I did not have the skills. I did not learn how to take notes. I did not learn how to study. I didn't know. And those were all things that I needed. I didn't need them in high school to get by, but I needed them in college. And so I had to learn them real quick. And if I hadn't learned them real quick, I, I would have probably dropped out of college and been that underachiever. Um, another thing is that uh, students might, uh, so to, to make my point is they're afraid of failure. They don't want to fail. So in order to, to not fail, they just avoid anything that would lead to failure. So that might be that academic activity. It might be even something like not going for the school play because they're afraid to fail. So there are a lot of gifted kids, I think, who are afraid to fail because we don't equip them um, with the, the tools they need that if they fail, how do they move around that? Um, how do they cope with that? And I, I think um, a lot of our regular education uh, classrooms are equipped to deal with the middle kid. Um, and, but that the high kid, when the teacher's like, well, it comes easy to them, we'll just let them be, we'll leave them alone, you know, and, and as a result, then they don't build up any res resistance or resilience to this failure, and they just avoid it. Um, they may procrastinate, and this is that game of school, procrastinating to the, to the last minute, and I, I tell this story, um, my daughter, my high, my daughter who's in college right now, when she was in high school, she's really smart, you know, she had a 4.2 GPA, um, she um, she would have a paper due Sunday at midnight. And so Friday would roll, and I'd know this, and Friday would roll around and I'd say, how's that paper coming? She's like, well, I haven't started on it yet. And then Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon would roll around. I said, how's the paper coming? She's like, well, I haven't started. And Sunday would come, I'm just like, are you going to start on that paper? And she goes, I'll get to it, don't worry. And then at 11.15 at night, like clockwork, she would stand up and she would go into the office and she would type up her, her paper. And then she would come in at 11.55 and say, dad, can you check it over for any you know, typos? And then she would submit it. And I would be like, please, let's let her get a bad grade. Uh, I, she needs to learn that she can't get away with this. Every time she got an A. And so she learned in the game of school that you can wait to the last minute and get an A. Um, but it's interesting because now that she's in college, she has learned she can't do that. Um, she did that once and it backfired on her. And so now she's like, I have a project due next week. And I'm like, oh, you're, you're going to start it next week. And she's like, oh, I already started on it. So she's learning that, you know, you, you can't get away with, you can only get away with that with so long. I mean, even in your own job. Um, so they avoid opportunities to, to challenge themselves. And uh, this, this happens quite often with gifted kids. They'll give a minimal response. So you're asking for an essay and they give a sentence. They give just the bare bones minimum. Those are all symptoms. And so when I look at the, and so when I look at under, underachievement, um, what I'm looking at is, or thinking of is that it's like a diagnosis. 
each kid comes in and they have different symptoms um, and you have to diagnose what is causing the problem. It's the only way that you can reverse the underachievement is to find out what's causing it. So once you find out what's causing it, then you can start to put into place strategies that are, that are going to reverse that underachievement. And so uh, some of those, uh, the, and there are lots of causes of underachievement. These are just the 10 that I identified as being probably the, the biggest ones. Um, and so boredom is a big one. You know, I, I, I get calls or emails all the time. My kid's bored in, in school. Uh, and so when they get bored, they misbehave. I mean, the, the idle hands, you know, uh, you know they're, if they're not engaged, they're going to, you know, do something that's not, not appropriate. Um, it could be their social emotional needs. It could be peer. I mean, some kids play dumb because they want to fit in. I mean, I, I'm always amazed when you're in an elementary school, I could walk into an elementary school classroom and I could pick out the gifted kid in 10 minutes without anyone telling me who it was. If there was one gifted kid in there, I could, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be able to figure it out pretty quickly. High school, you can't do it because uh, kids have learned to kind of mask their giftedness or to fit in or to, you know, be part of the crowd. And, and so it's, it's much more difficult, I think, in high school to identify just by, by uh, you know, looking at them who the gifted kid is. Um, it could be, I talked about intrinsic motivation, which is number six there. It could be a lack of skills. Uh, again, like we, we tell kids all the time, study for this test. Do we, but do we show them how to study? Do we give them those skills of studying? I can tell you I am 47 years old. I don't know how to study. I know how to cram but I do not know how to study. Um, and so, but I was talking to a friend of mine who's a doctor and he had a, he had a friend of his when he was in college who was a really good studier that he actually set like office hours and he'd say, I'm studying from this time to this time. And he would study and, and my, my friend learned this habit and he was able to go to medical school and become a very successful doctor by learning this skill. But he, he was a bit of an underachiever too when he was in high school and, and going into college, but this kind of turned him around a little bit. Um, it could be lack of programming. Um, so if you're a gifted kid and you're in a district that doesn't have any programming or has very little programming or has math and you're gifted in the language arts, you're going to be in a regular ed classroom and those teachers are going to do a, their, their best to try to meet your needs in a lot of cases. But it's really difficult in a, in a classroom where you have this huge spectrum of really gifted kid over here and special ed kid over here and trying to teach this whole gamut of kids. It is really difficult. I mean, I know we throw that word differentiation around like it's a, like it's a secret sauce. We can just go to the spice rack and sprinkle it on kids and they'll be fine. But it's really difficult to differentiate. Even in a gifted classroom, there's differentiation. There's different levels of giftedness. And differentiating can be really a challenge. And I think a lot of um, I think a lot of educators struggle with that, you know, you know and, and rightfully so, because it's a really difficult task. So let me pick a couple of these and, and give you some examples of strategies that you can, you can use. So um, one of these um, would be uh, the peers one I talked about before. So uh, if you don't have, they, and when I was researching for this book, I found that um, boys especially are, are more susceptible to underachievement. Um, and a lot of that is because they wanna fit in with their peers. The, it, the studies even show that African-American and Hispanic boys even are even uh, more so are underachievers because they, they wanna fit in and they'll be made fun of if they do well in school. So they'll just play dumb. Um, and so, a couple of the strategies that I had in there is, um, and these are, these are things that you can do in your school at different levels. One is acceleration. So if a kid is really good at math, is there the possibility that he moves up a math class? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm always amazed at the barriers we put up for kids sometimes. Like teachers will say, well, they can't do that because then there won't be anything for them to do next year. And it's like, that, that's not a good reason why not to do that. Um, so we, you know, it's not about making it easier for the teacher. It's about making it more challenging for the student. So I fight that battle all the time, you know, if a teacher or a teacher will teach a book in the sixth grade and a ninth grade teacher's like, well, they can't teach that book. I teach that book. And I'm like, aren't there like a zillion books that you could choose? It doesn't have to be that book. Um, and so accelerating a kid and putting them in a class where they can work to their potential, where they have other kids around them that are similar to their ability. Um, what Because a lot of times we, we go with the crowd and what the crowd's doing. If you're in a classroom where everyone is achieving at high levels, guess what? That's probably what you're going to do. Um, I tell this, this funny story. The very first year I was teaching, I had a gifted cluster group. Um, and it was 30 gifted kids in my classroom. And I come to find out about four months into the school year that 
25 of these kids were gifted and five of them were just randomly placed in the class. And I said, well, how did you decide how to place them? They're like, we just, we just randomly placed them. One of these kids was a special ed kid. He was getting A's in my class because he was keeping up with the class. The class had this expectation, you know, this is what we're going to do. This is, and I had my expectations because they were the gifted kids and this kid was getting A's and I didn't even realize he was a special ed kid, uh, which is probably really illegal on my part because the NIAP, but you know, he, he was, he did showed no signs of needing those accommodations or anything. He was doing really well in the class. So, you know, kids will, um, I think anyone, when you put a bar, they'll jump over it. And if you raise the bar, they'll jump over that and so on and so forth. But when you put the bar on the ground, they'll just step over it. You know, you have to, you have to keep raising the bar in a lot of cases. You can do that with cluster grouping, which is like putting a bunch of gifted kids into one class together. We do that in our district where we take a third graders who are gifted in ELA and put them in one class together. And then the teacher's spectrum of those, those levels is not so large. It's much smaller and it's easier to differentiate between that. Magnet programs are one that are near and dear to my heart, which is that you're pulling highly gifted kids into one location. So we have seven elementary schools in my district and we pull fourth graders who are gifted um, into, into this one school. And so what happens is, and I hear it all the time, my kid, parents will say, my kid has a friend for the first time, or my kid got invited to a birthday party for the first time. Because all of a sudden they have these, these peer mates. We have age mates and peer mates. Age mates are every kid when they're six years old goes into kindergarten. And, for, and we know any kindergarten teacher listening right now, you know, that, that, that doesn't make, that those kids are not at the same place. And yet we enter them in at the same place and progress them along at the same pace. Um, and so these are your age mates, but you're gonna have kids who you don't relate to because you are on a different, you know, that you think a little bit differently than them or you act a little bit differently than them. And those are called, and so the people that are similar to the way that you think are called peer mates. And gifted kids often have trouble finding peer mates because they have kids who are, the, who are the same age as them, but don't think like them. So when this kid's talking about dinosaurs and how cool Jurassic Park was, this, this kid over here is talking about the evolution of them and how they may have turned into birds eventually. And he, you know, he's, he's having a different conversation about the same topic. Um, and so magnet programs bring those kids all together and allow them to have peers, uh, which is why I think they're very valuable. Uh, and and I, I often cringe like when there are suggestions of being economical because magnet programs can, be expensive or whatever, but it's just a grouping. You put, you group the teachers differently, you know, whatever. And like my district complains, oh, well, we have to pay for the, to bust them over there. I'm like, don't you have to pay to bust them anywhere? So why is that an additional cost? And so sometimes, um, you know, the cost of a magnet program can pr preclude a, a district from doing that. Um, another strategy um, that I'll talk about is um, Giving, and I talk about a lot and do these with a lot of my projects, but giving kids independent research projects. Um, if a kid shows an ability to work on something um, at a high level, don't make him go through the, 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 um, the lesson with all the other kids. I mean, I often have teachers that will pre-assess and the kid gets 100%. And I'm like, what'd you do with them? Well, I made them do the lesson with everyone else. I'm like, they already showed they knew it. Why don't you try something differently? I had this kid, John, who was a fifth grader. He knew more about, he'd forgotten more about space than I ever cared to know about space. He really loves space, outer space. And so I said to John, John, there's nothing I'm going to be able to teach you that you don't already know. So why don't you learn about something you've always wanted to learn about and you're going to teach it to the class at the end of this three weeks. And so John did a project on black holes, uh, which he'd always wanted to know about. It wasn't part of our curriculum. It wasn't part of what we were, I was supposed to be teaching. But in three weeks, John gave a heck of a, uh, of a presentation on black holes that, uh, that, that would you know, a, a 12th grader would be pressed to do much less a fifth grader. Uh, but it was something that he really loved and he wanted to do. So he put a lot of effort into it. Um, mentorships are another thing there where you, you hook a kid up with someone who is a mentor. And sometimes those, those mentors happen quite organically, but sometimes you can, you, if a kid shows like proclivity from being an engineer, you can have, have an engineer, you know, have, if you have an engineer friend or an engineer student, uh, talk to that kid and have conversations with them. I use mentors with uh, when I was teaching writing classes. So I would hook them up with someone who was a professional writer and they would mentor those students, especially if kids who showed, um, you know, a high ability in, in writing. Passion project. If you can have kids work on things that they're passionate about, that's where that interesting comes into place on that goal valuation. They're going to be interested if they are, they're passionate about it. I'm always amazed 
that sometimes I would take grades away. I wouldn't grade something, but it was something kids really wanted to do and were very passionate about. And they would work twice as hard on that because they cared about it. Um, and so caring is a real big factor there. So those are, those are just some strategies and they're, they're laid out in the book. Um, and here's the, here's the tricky thing though. So you can't just say, well, kid is, is having this symptom. Here is my, uh, what I'm going to treat him with and then he'll be cured. It, 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 different kids, different kids are different in different ways. And so you, you're going to have to, what might work one day is not going to work the next day. And so that's why this underachievement thing is such a difficult thing is it's not, a, you can't just wave a magic wand and it's gone. You have to constantly be working with it, constantly have that relationship with the kid, constantly be thinking of different strategies that you can use with them. And that, that's how it can be really challenging. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, let me, let me, sh Thank you, Todd. That that was fantastic, and and I uh, I think what we're going to do now. Let me let me do a little housekeeping. Uh, we'll take we'll and that means that uh, with the audience take a look at that Q and A box. Now I've set the questions that are in there up so you can upvote them if you're particularly interested in having uh, Todd answer that question, and that'll give Stephanie a little bit of information about what you're interested in, in uh, hearing about. And then while you guys are taking a look at uh, taking a look at that, uh, let me, there were, there was definitely a question about uh, Todd's book mm -hmm. and let, let me show that. So this is when, when smart kids underachieve in school, uh, I've got the ISBN number down there and the price. This is available from the Proof Rock Press website at proofrock.com as is Stanley's books. Uh, also, you know, certainly you can get these from Amazon, uh, barnesandnoble.com and uh, your local bookseller. Uh, the, the books are available through any of those channels. Uh, uh, Amazon's gotten a little funky in the last, uh, the last week because, you know, uh, the books are less essential than, you know, obviously some of the medical uh, materials that they're shipping out. So uh, it's, uh, their, their shipping can be delayed, but, but generally uh, everything's fine and available on, on Amazon. I do want to, before we move into the Q&A, mention Todd's contact information. Uh, he's got a fantastic website I'll show you in just a second. And uh, there's, there's his email there. And uh, he's also available on Twitter. But let me, let me take you over to his website, thegiftedguy.com. And I'm going to stop sharing that guy and then come over to my web page here. And here is Todd Stanley's Really lovely job, Todd. <laughs> I love your website. It's it's really informative. There's a lot of uh, neat resources uh, at thegiftedguy.com. So uh, that's a, that's a definitely a place to stop off after the webinar if you'd like some more information. Uh, so we're kind of at a point now where I'm going to turn a bit of the Q&A over to uh, to Stephanie, who will sort of take some of the audience questions and and we'll see if we can feel them. Stephanie, go ahead. All right. Uh, so our first question is, uh, how important is it for teachers to avoid the power struggle with gifted kids? Uh, I think it doesn't with any kid, you got to avoid the power struggle. The, the power struggle that you, uh, you will have with a gifted kid, though, is that, and here's what I, I came to realization really quickly, is they're smarter than me. Um, I may have more life experience, I may have, you know, uh, you know, have situations they've never had, but they are smarter than me. So I'm not going to outsmart them. Um, and so I just gave into that. And I was like, you know what, they are smarter than me. I, you know, and so a kid would come up to me, it was really funny, because I taught science for five years, um, because I had my gifted K through 12 licensure, but I did not take any science classes in college. I hadn't taken science for like 12 years. And I was teaching it and kids would come up and they would say, Mr. Stanley, what's the what do you think about this? I'm like, that's a great question. Why don't you look that up? And, and I was doing it because I didn't know. And they were like, he's challenging us. He's making us think, you know, he's, and it was just, I didn't know. And so, um, but I, I would say like, if you, you try, like if a kid challenges, like that you did something, I, I see this a lot where a t, a, some of these kids will point out when something is wrong or you spelled something wrong or you made a mistake and they, they're on it like that. I mean, just give in to that. And so what I did at one point is I knew I was going to make a mistake. So I purposely started making mistakes on my assessments. And I would say, if you find the mistake, you get extra credit. And kids would then purposely look for the, the mistakes. But I think as teachers, we have to be willing to, uh, to make mistakes and not be the expert in everything because we're not. Uh, we're expected to be a lot of times, but we are, we are definitely not the expert on everything. So understanding that this kid knows more than I do on this. How can I use their 
know-how? How can I use their understanding of this to help them learn? Um, so, so it is really important to avoid those power struggles. Um, and sometimes it will be a discipline thing. Um, and, and I learned the fine art of instead of my first, I think my first two years, I spent the entire time yelling. Uh, it feels like I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> but I felt that way, and then so I learned the art of having a conversation with the kid afterward, out in the hallway, or, or you know, and not engaging that kid. Because what happens with most kids is you engage them, and then they want to engage back. Uh, and so if you just kind of diffuse it by talking about it later, personally, it's that connection again, that personal connection that you're making. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we also got a couple uh, similar questions about. Um, what are some strategies to get more out of students? Like if they only submit two sentences and you know that they can give you a lot more than that. So th there's a couple of things that you can do. Like I'll give you an example of something I did. I had a kid who, I was a social studies teacher um, and a kid, I, when I have a conversation with him, I knew he knew what he was talking about. He was a really bright kid, but every time I asked him to do an essay, he wrote one sentence. And so I got to the point where I was like, does writing have to be the way he expresses himself? He doesn't like to write. So, and this, this tells you how old I am. I had a tape recorder in the back room and I said, just record your essay verbally. Uh, and then I'll, and he talked for 45 minutes. Um, and so I, what I would say when it, with a lot of these kids is we have to think of alternative assessments that are gonna allow them to use their skill um, and their skills. And so if a kid is really, I got a kid who's really into making movies. He wanted to be the next Steven Spielberg. So every project we had, he wanted to make a movie. And I'm like, great, make another movie. That's fine. Um, but you know, that, that's part of that passion, that motivation is if you, you may be give, making kids do something they don't wanna do, but if you give them a vehicle that they do enjoy, then it's going to change everything. So like you, if the kid's really good, really into computers, I had a kid who um, really loved video games and he, he taught how to do physical versus chemical changes by creating a video game. And he was, he was so passionate about that. Pro he was a C student for me, uh, but he got an A on this project because he, he was passionate about it. So we have, as teachers, we have to be willing to know that one size does not fit all to give students choices. I like menu boards. Um, I like giving kids like, like lots in, in that performance assessment book. I talk about lots of alternative assessments, but pencil to paper assessment is not the way that we learn as human beings. And yet that's the way we're, we're measuring that a lot of times. So we have to figure out ways to engage kids uh, by, by tapping into what they, they care about and what, they, what they're able to show. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, we also got a question about stress. Uh, so how does stress like from abuse, violence, lack of food, uh, affect gifted students and their performance? Yeah, just like it does everyone. I mean, yeah. it's, it's horrible that it happens. And I talk about some strategies in the book, like home life problems. Um, so if you, you are at home, so, and one of those strategies that, and I do this still in my district to this day is, I have before school or after school activities for kids to participate in. So like I'll have a chess club that will take place in the afternoon after school, or I'll have a gaming club at one of our elementaries that take place before school. And the reason why I do that is a lot of these kids need to be somewhere where they feel safe and cared for. Um, and so I, I, as much as I would love to adopt the kids and, and take them to my, my house and then my wife would kill me as a result, um, you know, that's not gonna happen. We can't change their home life. We can't tell a parent how to parent their kids. Uh, we can only control what is in the takes place with with these kids in the classroom, and so um, I I try to I try to expand my classroom where I'm not just meeting with them during the school hours, but in the mornings and the afternoons there are, there are possibilities too, or even during my lunch they can come in and talk to me, or they can you know have a conversation, um, and so that that's one strategy that you can use with kids who have that abuse or that stress. I, I, there are a lot of gifted kids that suffer from perfectionistic uh, tendencies or high anxiety because they want everything to be perfect. Um, and again, it, it's the culture you, you make, you create in your class. If you create a culture in your class where it's okay to fail, to go big and fail, and that's okay, it's not going to penalize you, then that kid's going to be willing to take risks. But a lot of times what happens in classrooms is, is we're like, oh, it's okay to fail. Oh, by the way, you missed that. So you got an F on that. So it's not okay to fail. We're sending mixed, mixed, mixed message. So you have to create a culture in your classroom where it's okay for those kids to make mistakes. I, I heard a, um, Lisa Van Gemmer was talking at a, a conference a, a, a few uh, years ago, and she said, I would have this project where kids, in order to get an A, they had to do C work. So there was a rubric and they had to like do C work in order to get the A. And so kids had to 
do badly, or not badly, but not as good as they could. So it, it taught them, and she uses this with a few students, but it taught them it didn't have to be perfect all the time. And so it kind of it gave them a license to not be perfect. Right. Yeah, do we have time for another? Yeah, go Rachel? ahead, Stephanie. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Uh, we got a question about, uh, do you have a good resource for passion projects? Uh, um, here, here, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and <laughs> a, a lot of my project-based learning books, um, are, and I'm, not, I'm really not shilling my own books, I swear, but a lot of them are you know, passion projects where kids can do that. I know John Lester has written, uh, who's a colleague of mine from Ohio, he's written a book called Passion Projects from Pieces of Learning. Um, I, it's funny that that's asked because I'm right now I'm working on a thing because of what's going on right now. I know the last month of school is going to be tough. They're already seeing kids. We had a conversation just today where they're seeing kids start to um, kind of go down in motivation in their work. And so I'm creating projects that kids can do at the end of the year that are like passion projects. And I have a, I'm going to have high school, I'm going to have middle school, and I'm going to have elementary. Um, and the idea here is that a teacher could push this out to a kid, kid could latch on something they're passionate about and, and learn that. So that's going to be on my website uh, at the beginning of uh, May. Uh, and oh, so nice. yeah. just that's know that, that that's, that's a resource I'm pushing out to my teachers and I'm going to make available on my website as well. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a source that you could use. Um, but I would say when it comes to a resource for passion projects is talk to the kid and find out what they're passionate about. That's your resource is find out what they care about. And so um, I, I would have student contracts where kids would say what they wanted to learn and they would make objectives, but they would create the project themselves. You don't have to do all the work. Um, they can create their own passion projects if you give them the space to do that. So that's my recommendation. The, the best recommendation for passion projects is to talk to the student and let them form them themselves. Yeah, also, if those of you who are interested in other books, uh, the Proof Rock Press publishes some, uh, if, if you go to the website, proofrock.com and, and search for Genius Hour or uh, uh, Passion, actually, if you just type in Passion, all three of our books that are related to that topic uh, are, are, are especially the genius hour book is a, is yeah. a tremendously good seller and it's good. Yeah. It's a good resource. Yeah. Andy's book is really, really good. The genius hour book is very good. So, and, and I was, I should have mentioned genius. Hour. That's exactly what genius hour is, is, uh, you know, latching on to a passion. And, you know, we, in our fifth grade classroom right now, uh, we have kids that are doing genius hour. They're not for a grade. Again, they work harder on them than they do on the things they are getting graded on uh, because it's something that they're passionate about. And we need to do a better job at tapping into that passion that kids have. Well, Todd, listen, I, I, we've run out of time and I apologize to those of you who had questions. What I will do is uh, I'll, I'll shoot some of those questions over to Todd and yep. uh, he'll be happy to answer some of those things Fair off enough. off off list. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I just I want to thank everybody who joined us today. Uh, had a huge crowd. It was great. Uh, also, if you're interested in more of these free webinars, basically, you know, Stephanie and I, we have a lot of time on our hands. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Stephanie's actually very busy. <laughs> I, I found my whole job changed as a result of this stay-at-home order. So I'm, I'm, uh, I got a little time on my hands. So I decided to uh, set up a weekly webinar with, uh, with my authors. And so every every Tuesday at three o'clock Central Time for the next, uh, you know, uh, I'm probably a couple of months. Uh, I'm going to bring in a, a nationally recognized speaker, and uh, we're going to have one of these webinars. And and uh, please remember, I'll send certificates out of attendance out but it probably take me two three days and then uh, I'll get a webinar recording posted and I'll also let those of you who won the door prizes the five copies of, of uh, Todd's book I'll let you know that you're uh, winners in the next two to three days as well Todd thank you so much for attending thanks for having me I really appreciate it so Stephanie thanks for your help thanks so much okay thanks everybody bye-bye okay.